Okay, it's uh, one o'clock, so I'll call the Green Mountain Care Board's uh, meeting of April 12th, 2023 to order. Um, today we have two uh, agenda items. The first being a potential vote relating to the revisions to the certificate of need monetary thresholds. And the second is a presentation um, by Christopher Whaley from the RAND Corporation um, relating to healthcare market concentration. Um, so first I'll turn it to Ms. Susan Barrett for the Executive Director's Report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I do want to mention that um, I was reminded by Kristen Legeness, our Executive Assistant, that the state of Vermont is experiencing some network issues. So I don't know whether that's what you ran into, Tom. And um, if we do get disconnected for any reason, that um, we would just ask people to just sign back on. But fingers crossed, um, ADS works really hard. That's our digital services division of the state to keep us all online, and we thank them for that. Um, we also have uh, a couple of ongoing um, or uh, public comment periods. One is ongoing, and that is the one I mention every week about the all pair model, the next potential model. Uh, please submit any of those comments to us. We share those with our colleagues at the Agency of Human Services and the Governor's Office as they are leading those negotiations and, the, and implementing the current model. We also have a open pub public comment period on the One Care Vermont resubmission. Um, we would appreciate any comments you have by April 28th so that the board could take those into consideration as they review that resubmission. And then we did post a public comment period for um, the CON thresholds, which we talked about last week and which we are voting on uh, today. So uh, with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And um, we'll take up the meeting minutes from April 5th, 2023. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move approval. So moved. Second. Okay. Is there any board discussion? Those in favor of approving the minutes from April 5th, 2023, please say aye. 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 And the motion carries unanimously and the minutes are approved. And we'll turn to Mr. Barber, our general counsel, um, for the potential revisions to certificate of need monetary thresholds. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for the record, my name is Michael Barber, general counsel. Um, I'm here to follow up on <clears throat> Uh, presentation from last week on Hello, these jurisdictional Act thresholds. Please leave me a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you. Marissa, I think you might not be muted. Um, so uh, I just have three slides for this presentation. Um, uh, so this is a slight variation on the slide that I showed in the presentation last week. The column labeled category lists the different CON jurisdictional thresholds that are uh, in the statute. Just to remind you, there are several uh, categories that don't have any sort of monetary value associated with them, and those aren't kind of at issue today. Uh, the column labeled base is showing you the dollar amounts that are in the statute. The column current shows you where the thresholds uh, are as as they Hello, stand today. At 802-377-0194, please leave me a message. And I'll just, um, and then, uh, so I there was a error in Last week's slides, I just wanted to note that for you. I, I believe I had said in last week that the the increase that the board had approved last year was 12.8%. It was actually 12.18%. So I apologize for that. Um, but so again, the, the current column is showing you where the thresholds are today. And then the um, the future column is showing you what the thresholds would be if you increased them by 
I just changed it to 20%. It's CPI growth since July 2018 is just over 20%. I figured just to round down to have some some round numbers uh, would be good. So that's what that is showing you. Um, so that's 20% over the base dollar values that are in the statute. It's 6.97% over the current uh, thresholds. <clears throat> so any questions there um, before I move on to potential motion language? Okay, based on the discussion last week, I, uh, you know, I heard support um, from the people who, board members who were uh, speaking, and and so I figured I'd just um, draft some motion language for you to um, consider. So the current revision language would um, uh, effectuate a 20% increase over the, the base amounts um, as reflected in the prior slide, and then I, I'd heard Dr. Merman asked about, you know, can we automate this uh, so we don't have to deal with this each year? Yes, you can. Uh, here's how you might do that. And so that's there for your consideration if you would like to do that. And that's all I have. Um, Mike, I had one question. If we automate it, but then for whatever reason in a particular earlier year we choose not to follow the automated automated process what would we do or how would we flag that for consideration um i think you'd have to vote to not do that um and i'm not sure how whether I, I suppose a board member, if they were concerned about that, could approach um, Susan or I, and we could put it on on the board calendar for a discussion. But um, I think there would need to be a vote to kind of take it out of this automatic adjustment. Right. And Mike, um, would it that? Sorry, Owen, are, were you done? Uh, yeah, I'm done. Any anyone else can go ahead. Um, just on that same topic so i think in order then for that to work there would have to be some sort of uh like notice right so there'd have to be some publication of the the update that would happen automatically so that there's something that triggered a board member to say hey that doesn't look right so, and I think those process details could be worked out by staff, um, it, but I would think that what we, if we want to automate it, what I would suggest is that we make sure that there's some sort of sort of publication with an opportunity for public comment, which then gives the board members an opportunity to put it on an agenda. I don't know what people if people think that makes sense or not, but to me that makes sense. That way everybody's sort of alerted. Here's what would happen automatically if there's some issue with it. It could be brought to our attention either by through public comment or by a board member noticing it on their own. I did just want to note because that um, I think that all makes sense. Uh, I had included a, a January here. Um, you guys are really busy at the end of the year, so, so so January may not be the best time if there's like a notice that you get that here, you know, this this is what the standards are going to change to um, and kind of, so I'm just, that might not be the best month, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that does make sense because things are, often pretty busy in December with the ACO regulatory process. Um, but certainly we could do it by the end of, like by February 1st or something. That might make sense. I mean, I'm, I'm supportive of that. 
I think it'd be fine if it was rounded to the nearest percent. I don't think it has to be super specific down to a tenth or a hundredth of a percent. February 1st seems like a reasonable time. Seems reasonable to me that the thresholds would increase over time based upon these indices of inflation. So I support it. Any other board comment or questions? I do not have a comment or question, but I'm happy to make a motion when you're ready for it, Chair. Um, I think I'm going to let the HCA in public comment first before uh, a motion, um, but but that'd be great, Robin, um, after that. Um, does the health care advocate have any questions or comments? Comments? Nothing from us, Chair Foster. Thank you. Great. And I'll turn to public comment via the raise the hand function. Okay, Ms. Lunch, if you have a motion, I think I think we can go ahead. Great. I'm going to do this as two motions because I think it'll just be a little um, cleaner. So I move to increase the monetary thresholds for certificate of need jurisdiction to be 20% greater than the amount specified in 18 VSA section 9434A through C. Second. Is there any board discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the motion carries unanimously. So the second motion, um, uh, so I'll change this a little bit to reflect the discussion. And um, in terms, but before I do that, in terms of the rounding, um, I did have a question. Does it make sense to round to the nearest percent or to the nearest like $10,000 so that it's kind of an even amount? I think I would recommend nearing to the nearest, rounding down to the nearest $10,000 um, rather than changing the percent from the CPI. That makes sense. It's also a little bit easier maybe for people to keep track of too. All right, so I'll jump in with a motion. I move to modify the monetary thresholds for certificate of need jurisdiction specified in 18 VSA 9434A through C uh, by February 1st of each year to reflect changes in the consumer price index for all consumers, US city average, all items since July 2018, rounded down to the nearest uh, $10,000 after a period of notice and public comment as specified by the general counsel. Second. So just to, just to clarify, my intent there is that Mike can figure out the specifics of the process and uh, public comment period, and that that wouldn't have to come back before us for a vote. I heard a second. Is there any board discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the vote carries unanimously and the motion is approved. Um, Mr. Barber, thank you very much for your help on this and your presentation. This was, this was great. Thank you. Our next agenda item is a presentation, a roundtable discussion with Chris Whaley from RAND, and I'm going to turn to Member Walsh to introduce Mr. Whaley. Thank you, Chair Foster, and we want to welcome Chris Whaley. He's a health economist um, from RAND. His uh, work has been very influential over the past several years, um, including uh, considerable input to the Congressional Budget Office. Um, he's visited the board before, several years ago, when the RAND Healthcare Pricing Project began. Um, that's a four-part series uh, that Chris was instrumental in. 
Um, he's also done uh, influential work and uh, deep work on hospital pricing drivers, the effect of consolidation, or in regions of the U.S. without consolidation, just the pure effect of market power. Um, this is the third of our three-part series that began with Jeff Stenson several weeks ago that has highlighted the impact of market power on price setting. Uh, recall that Jeff <clears throat> from MedPAC, uh, his work began in 2010, which um, taught us that the old thinking about cost shifting really hasn't proven to be true in the 13 years since. It's more a case of price discrimination. Um, our second speaker, Zach Cooper from Yale, built upon Stensland's work, which was really a small study. Um, uh, Zach's uh, work was notable because it included all hospitals in the US. His work also included all payers, which had important implications for our understanding of Dartmouth's findings and with with Medicare. Um, Chris has built upon those and the work of those projects and others. Um, and the, the reason that I was very interested in having Chris with us, um, he goes further to uh, detail what states can do um, as we come to understand the effects of market power, what are the policy and regulatory options available to us and how big an impact they might have. Um, so with that, for a background, I'll turn it over to Chris. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Great. Uh, thank you for, for inviting me, Tom, and it, it's really uh, great to, to present uh, to this audience. Um, and it's also really great to, to take part in what sounds like a really great series. And, and so both uh, Jeff Denson and, and Zach Cooper are, are fantastic researchers, and so it's really uh, great to be a, a part of this series. Um, just for some quick kind of overview or agenda items, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll touch a little bit on consolidation and its impacts of consolidations, although, you know, frankly, uh, Zach is, is really an expert in that area, and it sounds like it's already been um, pretty well uh, versed in, in, in what we know about consolidation and its impacts. I'll then talk a little bit about what we've done on hospital prices. This is actually pretty overall very similar to what Zach Cooper and team have done around looking at prices across the country. We've done... Uh, slightly different analyses using different data, but have frankly come up with basically the, the same uh, conclusion. So using two different research groups, two different national sources of, of data, we, we end up with roughly the, the same uh, conclusion that prices in the United States for the commercially insured population are high, and those prices don't uh, necessarily lead to improvements in quality or patient outcomes. And also importantly, and, and again, aligning with, with Jeff Stenson's early work, not driven by underpayments from Medicare or other public payers. I'll then, as Tom uh, mentioned, talk about what are the, the options and what, what are the potential policy solutions. So if we know these are in some sense the, the challenges of the healthcare system, how can regulators and, and policymakers like yourself actually think about what to do next and how to make the healthcare system in the United States and in Vermont that is more equitable and affordable. Uh, so with that, uh, just diving in. So a, a key challenge uh, in, in the United States is just the, the levels of market concentration in the United States. So if we use data, you know, not from uh, you know, outside researchers, but actually from the American Hospital Association, and apply definitions of market concentration that the Federal Trade Commission, the Department of Justice, and other regulators commonly use to determine whether or not a market is concentrated or competitive, one of the things that I, I think really stands out about hospital markets markets in the United States is just the extreme degree of concentration. So over half of people in the United States live in a market that is either incredibly concentrated, so the highly uh, concentrated market definition that FTC and DOJ use, or moderately concentrated. Less than 30% of, of Americans actually live in a hospital market that is considered competitive if we were to think about you know, any other uh, good or service that we'd have access to. So for, for policymakers and economists and, and, and regulators, this is a, a huge concern for how we should think about access to care and, and uh, uh, use of services in, in uh, healthcare. So we, we know that hospitals are incredibly important for, for patients and, and for communities, but we also know from every other market and every other setting, 
that monopolies lead to much higher prices. And we also have lots of evidence that monopolies do not improve quality of care. And so it's really important that we have access to affordable and high quality care. And the levels of concentration in, in the United States for hospital care are certainly a factor that I, I think dilutes a lot of that uh, access to affordable and high quality care. And so just uh, probably following up very similar to what, what Zach presented, we, we know from many, many studies that hospital mergers and hospital consolidation lead to increases in, in prices, no improvements in the quality of care or access to care, and in many cases, actually reductions in care quality. And I think importantly, also reductions in wages for nurses, physicians, and other health professionals. And so while there is certainly uh, more money being made by dominant healthcare systems and providers, those resources actually don't trickle down to the people providing care. Just a, a, a quick summary of, of what we know about hospital markets. Uh, again, uh, actually highlighting in, in the third bullet point, uh, Zach's paper. Uh, if we look at just the, the range of studies that have looked at what happens when hospital markets get more, more concentrated, what happens to prices, all but one study actually found a, a pretty sizable increase in prices. Prices incre increases range from about a 5% increase all the way up to above 50% increase in prices. And so there is, I, I think, robust and irrefutable evidence from the academic literature and, and from independent researchers that hospital consolidation leads to increases in prices. Another study that I, I want to highlight from Professor Lee Moore Daphne and team at Harvard Business School actually looked at what happens to quality. And so they, they looked at every single hospital merger over roughly a 20 year period and looked at what happened to, to both experience of care and clinical quality metrics such as readmission rates and mortality rates. For both the, the patient experience measures and, and also clinical measures, there's actually a slight reduction in quality outcomes. Uh, and for, for uh, clinical processes, we, we actually don't find any change in quality. And so while hospital mergers and hospital consolidation certainly lead to, to higher prices, they don't lead to the improvements in quality that I, I think advocates and proponents of hospital consolidation argue are, are naturally occurring through consolidation. So a common, I, I think, argument is that hospitals are going to, and provider groups are going to consolidate, maybe raise prices, but the, those price increases are really needed to finance improvements in quality and access to the care. But when we look at the data, we, we find lots of evidence that first step of increases in prices, but no change in that second step that, that's promised uh, benefits and, and improvements in quality of care. Another consolidation trend that I, I want to uh, raise is just the, the rise of not hospital mergers, but actually what happens when hospitals and healthcare systems acquire physician practices. In many senses, I, I think this is the dominant trend in healthcare markets in the United States. So if we were to kind of go back in the, the 2000 uh, to 2010 period, that's really when a lot of the, the hospital mergers happened. And the more recent trend over the last decade has been this form of vertical consolidation or acquisition of physician practices. So in a recent paper that we had where we looked at, at, at this type of consolidation for three large uh, uh, physician specialty practices and in groupings, we found roughly a doubling in the share of physicians that are directly employed by a hospital system or their physician practice has been acquired by a healthcare system. So again, this is the, the dominant trend that I, I think is really fundamentally reshaping healthcare markets and how care is delivered in the United States. We, as researchers and policymakers, I think are especially concerned about vertical integration in physician acquisition by, by hospital groups and healthcare systems due to what I call the arbitrage opportunity in healthcare. So if you're a physician and you're independent and you want to, uh, say, refer a patient to, say, get an MRI or a colonoscopy, you have lots of places to refer that patient to, and, and you might send uh, th those patients to uh, community providers and, and non-hospital providers. But the same service that's done in a hospital uh, system, actually both in, in Medicare and also in commercial payers, costs roughly double the price. And so the kind of low-hanging arbitrage opportunity, if you will, in the healthcare system is to acquire a physician practice, 
and ask that physician to, uh, or you know, direct that physician rather to refer their patients not to community providers, but actually back to the healthcare system. Uh, and, and that again, roughly doubles the prices for many common downstream services. This is something that leads to effectively the same price increases as going out and acquiring all these providers uh, without raising the, the level of regulatory scrutiny that might uh, uh, potentially limit these types of acquisitions. And so through these referral pattern changes in, in where care is delivered, vertical integration can, can essentially operate as a back doorway towards horizontal and hospital consolidation. We've seen in a number set of, of settings actually this exact uh, uh, effect, where once a hospital uh, uh, acquires a physician practice for common services like laboratory tests and imaging tests, the physician refers their patients back to the hospital system that acquired them, and prices both in Medicare and commercial payers increase quite a bit. And so, for example, just for five common imaging and lab tests, in one year following physician consolidation, there was about a $75 million increase in, in spending for Medicare, and this happened really instantaneously following consolidation. And so this exact same trend is happening across the United States, it impacts not just Medicare, but also commercial payers, and again, it's not just limited to these five common tests, but is really anything that requires a physician referral. And so this is something that, that is, again, a, uh, a dominant trend in healthcare markets that's leading to higher prices and increased spending. Then the, uh, the, the uh, final thing I, I wanted to point on, uh, on just kind of the background, is what we've done around hospital prices. Again, this, this really uh, echoes uh, some earlier work that, we, that we've done and also, again, aligns very closely with Zach Cooper and his team. And what we've done is actually taking a little bit uh, different approach and instead of acquiring uh, or using data from, from national data vendors uh, that, that Zach and team have done, we actually went out and got data from self-funded employers, uh, so employers from across the country. We also got data from many state all-payer claims databases, including actually the Vermont APCD. The, the benefit of getting data from these pathways is that we can actually name individual provider prices and healthcare system prices rather than just keeping things at the aggregate geographic level. In our data, we've actually measured prices in two different ways. So one is relative to a Medicare benchmark. And so essentially what we've done is we've taken what Medicare pays for services on, and essentially said, okay, how, how much would Medicare pay for the exact same service at the exact same provider on the exact same day? And what is the relative price for what a, a commercial payer would pay for that same service at the same provider? The benefit of using the Medicare benchmark is that Medicare incorporates lots of additional payment uh, uh, sources that, that uh, contribute to actual reasons why maybe we want to pay some providers differently. So for example, some providers uh, do uh, have a, a larger share of uncompensated care patients, and so Medicare does some adjustment for that. Uh, Medicare also adjusts based on, on the cost of hiring physicians and other staffers, and so those are probably reasonable things to adjust for. If you don't want to add in those, those Medicare additional payments, we also have a standardized price, which is essentially uh, adjusting based on the, the procedural complexity and the patient composition across different hospitals. And so even though hospitals treat different patients and, and perform different services, we can have much more of an apples to apples comparison on, on prices. We've put this data in a, a public report uh, where, where we have kind of our high level summary, and we also have data on prices for individual facilities and, and systems. And we've put this data in a, a tool called Say Transparency, which I, I can show you a quick screenshot in a couple of slides. What we find in, in the study is just that there is a, a tremendous range in prices across the country. And so, for example, if we look at states like Hawaii, Arkansas, and Washington, prices are around 150% Medicare. The same uh, time, uh, states like Florida, West Virginia, and South Carolina, prices are over 300% of Medicare. And so just comparing average prices for, for hospital care, uh, there's roughly a 2x range in prices across the country. Now, of course, you can uh, access care in, in, in Washington and hospitals uh, still provide services in, in Arkansas, but they're able to operate at a, a level of prices that's roughly half of what we see in other parts of the country. 
So this is a huge and important industry, and it's a market where we have a tremendous range in, in prices. What I, I think we as researchers worry about is whether or not this, this range in prices is actually driven by maybe things that we want to pay for uh, more. So our, our uh, hospitals, again, in Florida, West Virginia, and South Carolina, much better than, than in other parts of the country. Or is this something that is maybe due to market forces and differences in market structure across markets? Uh, and, and so I should also highlight that we actually find on average, uh, Vermont prices are, are slightly below the national average at about 215% Medicare compared to the average of 250% Medicare. But even within uh, Vermont, we find roughly the, the same level of variation as we would across the country. Uh, so so in, in some uh, large health care systems in Vermont, prices are close to 300% of Medicare, whereas among independent hospital systems and, and the Springfield Medical Center, prices are, are closer to 175% of Medicare. So again, if we're to look at just the level of prices and uh, the range of prices in the state of Vermont, there's almost the same level of price variation as if we were to compare nationally. And so price variation is not something that just happens across different markets. It's also something that healthcare exists within markets and in between different markets. We've, as I mentioned earlier, put a lot of this data in a online dashboard. Uh, and so the, the link here is, is uh, uh, in blue. And if you just Google state transparency, this is the, the first thing that, that pops up. And so in, instead of just looking at uh, kind of average healthcare system uh, prices, this actually looks at prices for individual hospitals in, in Vermont. And again, for the individual hospitals, we, we uh, also find a tremendous range in prices from over 300% of Medicare for Southwest Vermont Health, uh, Hospital to uh, around 150% of Medicare at Mount Ascension, or Mount uh, Sydney Hospital, rather. The blue bars here are the price that we see in our data. And so again, this is using the, the national uh, collection of, of data and, and in Vermont, the Vermont All-Payer Claims Database. And so we, we really have a robust set of data for Vermont. And then also the, the green bars are what we call the break-even price. And so this is using actually data that hospitals report to CMS on their payer mix uh, and, and also um, uh, their, their cost for treating patients and, and then the revenue for, for patients for different payers and how much they would have to charge hospitals to break even. And so for example, the, uh, the bar or the gap rather between the blue bar and the green bar is uh, represents rather the, the margin that hospitals make on commercial payers. And so for some hospitals, you can see that that margin or that gap uh, between the blue and green bars is very large, indicating that those hospitals uh, do well financially on, on commercial payers. We've then tried to unpeel the onion a little bit and look at what actually drives prices. And so one of the kind of most common, I think, arguments, uh, and it sounds like uh, you've had experience uh, of, of thinking through these arguments, is whether or not prices are, rather commercial prices are due to underpayments on uh, public payers, so Medicare, Medicaid, or uncompensated care patients. And so this is the, the cost shifting argument. And there, uh, and, and I'll present some data on this in the slide, we, we actually don't find any evidence that, that cost shifting drives prices. The, I think the argument uh, on cost shifting uh, really has to go in both directions. So if cost shifting is true, then Medicare is raising prices uh, or Medicare payments to hospitals in its largest amount in, in several decades this year. And so if cost shifting is true, then what that would they require is that commercial prices are going to come down next year. And I, I, I don't think we expect that that's going to happen. We find uh, some, but actually rather minimal correlation with, with the patient quality and safety outcomes. And so it's not the case that hospital uh, prices on, on the commercial side are really funding improvements in, in patient care and outcomes. Where we do find a pretty strong relationship is between market power and provider concentration. So providers that have a, a, a dominant marketing uh, or uh, negotiation power with insurers are the ones that are able to negotiate higher prices and command higher prices in the market. 
And again, that, that's consistent with uh, the, the monopoly story. And also I, I think what really uh, drives and is the motivation for many types of hospital consolidation. So j just to dive into the cost shifting story a little bit, we, we actually used our data to, to test that um, and actually see whether or not that's true. And so how we did that is we took each hospital's price. So again, this is relative to Medicare on, on the left-hand axis, uh, on the vertical axis, and then plotted that against the hospital's share of patients that are, are non-private insurance. And so this includes uh, Medicare patients, uh, Medicaid patients, uninsured patients, and charity care patients. And so if it's the case that hospitals are charging higher prices to offset having more uh, public patients and, and, and non-commercial patients, then what we should see is that the hospitals that have lots of, of uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and uninsured patients should be the ones that are charging the highest prices. And those that have relatively few uh, public and uninsured patients should be the ones charging lower prices. Now, uh, so that should be kind of an increasing uh, trend through this chart. Now, when you look at this, uh, at least I see just a, a random scattering of dots. And the, uh, if we do the statistical test, we, we don't find any relationship between uh, the two. And so it's, it's not the case that hospitals are charging higher prices to offset underpayments from Medicare, Medicaid, and uninsured patients. In a recent study, we also looked at whether or not hospital price increases led to improvements in quality. Uh, and there for you know, several dimensions of clinical quality, we, we actually don't find any change in, in, in quality. And so all the, uh, the, the changes here are, are very small and they're not statistically significant. Uh, and so it's again, not the case that hospital prices lead to improvements in patient quality outcomes. And so th that's a, a maybe um, dire, if you will, view of, of hospital markets and, and, and spending. But I, I think it's also important to recognize that you know, this is not to say a problem needs to, to stand alone and continue, but there are actually many policy options that have really been proposed and lots of thought that's been gone into to these questions. And so how, how should we as a society, regulators and researchers think about these types of questions? And so the, the policy options that are really uh, kind of on the table range from things like, well, what if we just have more price transparency uh, and say give patients incentives to, to go out and, and shop for care or, or think about you know, what hospitals are high versus low quality or think about the value of care. And also things ranging from antitrust enforcement. So maybe uh, the FTC should just go through and break up large hospital systems or prevent uh, future uh, mergers. They're thinking more a little about, about prices. So whether this is kind of direct rate regulation or thinking about public option policies that would have a indirect uh, cap on, on prices. And what, one of the things that we, we really noticed uh, as we started this work is that while there's many studies out there, there's not really kind of a, a systematic comparison of what policies will work. And so if we do one policy versus the other, what's gonna happen and, and what are the, the potential savings? And then what are the, the potential costs to implementing those policies? So what we wanted to do in our study is really try and create what we call a, a menu of policy impacts. And think about if you were to do policy A versus policy B, and then think about if you were to you know, uh, shape the, the construction of one policy versus another, what might be the potential impacts? Uh, and, and so what we did is we, we thought about the policies that have actually been proposed uh, by either uh, policymakers, so this is people uh, in, in DC or people in different states, or researchers, so academic researchers or, or people in think tanks or other organizations. Then we wanted to say, well, if you, you know, slice and dice one policy one way versus another, what might happen and, and what's kind of the, the, the way a policy would actually be implemented. And then we use data from what's called the hospital cost report information system, which is the cost report data that hospitals report to Medicare on their actual financial status and a lot of their, their pricing data. And then we use these types of data to, to estimate what would happen under each of the, the policy options. Uh, and so again, we, we, we think of this as a, a policy menu. And so our, our kind of three uh, courses, if you will, range from regulating prices to improving price transparency to increasing market competition through, through market regulations. And so when we thought about regulating uh, prices, you know, this is a, a policy to either directly or indirectly cap prices for, for healthcare. 
we thought about different considerations, including how much are you going to cap prices? So if you say cap prices at 100% of Medicare, that's probably going to have a, a pretty big bite versus if you let prices uh, be capped at, at anything above, say, 500% of Medicare. So those are going to be uh, two important considerations that are, are going to pretty clearly impact uh, how, how you uh, implement this policy. We also thought about the scope of payers and providers. And so we could say, well, we're going to uh, set all prices in kind of a, a Maryland style uh, all payer model, but increase prices for, for Medicare to 150% Medicare. So have a 50% a increase in Medicare payments, but then bring down commercial payments again to 150% Medicare. We could also think about uh, only capping providers who have prices above a, a certain threshold. If we think that, that 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 threshold or those providers are getting those prices through anti-competitive reasons. So, for example, if a hospital is a monopoly hospital or has a, a dominant market concert, uh, position, then maybe that's a, a hospital that we would target. A hospital that is in a much more competitive market but has the same price maybe wouldn't be impacted. And so we, we kind of thought about the, the scope of, of both payers and providers and how these policies would be designed. Then we also uh, wanted to be uh, cognizant of, of political receptivity. And so if we're trying to do something like cap prices, uh, that, that's something that you know I'm sure everyone on the call is, is much more aware of th than I am, uh, just what the, the political kind of process of doing that would be. And, and some of these uh, maybe policies that would save more money uh, probably, you know, frankly, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be that, that viable to actually make it through the political process. And then we also wanted to think about quality of care. Uh, and so while you know, in, you know, small uh, changes in, in provider prices from, from year to year don't seem to have a, a huge change in, um, in the, the, the quality of, of healthcare delivered or access to care, it you know, certainly is the case that if we were to you know, take a huge amount of money, so a you know, trillion dollars out of the healthcare system, uh, that's going to have quality and, and other access repercussions. And so you know, we, we want to acknowledge uh, the, those potential impacts as well. We, we then uh, thought about uh, improvements in price transparency. So th this is the, um, the, the policy that I think of the ones on the table has actually gotten the most traction. And we have actually seen the last couple of years, federal and, and more recently state policies designed to improve price transparency. And so you know, th this seems to be a policy that actually has gotten off the ground and uh, has actually uh, led to some changes in, in uh, how we think about prices in healthcare. And so what we really wanted to think about is what's the, the type of data that would be out there and how could we uh, actually think about policies that would improve price transparency, but then also how would this data be used? So there, there's really, I, I think, two main ways that the price transparency information can be used. The, the first way, and the, I think the way that's maybe um, gotten the most political and attraction and attention is the idea that patients are probably you're going to use this data to go out and shop and say, you know, I, I need a knee replacement. Should I go to hospital A versus B? And I can use price transparency to compare prices, quality of care, and access to care. I'm, I'm, I'm frankly a little bit skeptical of that argument, uh, or at least in, in other studies. We haven't seen that the kind of consumer-focused use of price transparency really leads to drastic changes in, in provider prices. The second way is uh, use of price transparency, both by employers. So my, my employer uh, can can go out and say, uh, I, I know now know prices in, in a market and we're going to kind of collectively on behalf of everyone in the organization, design say a narrow network plan or a plan that, that uh, uh, funnels patients to high quality and lower price providers. Another uh, similar way is uh, used by, by regulators. And so for example, everyone here uh, is, is aware of price transparency largely from, from the work that, that you know, Zach and myself and others have done around provider prices and are now thinking about ways to address uh, uh, provider markets and provider prices. So in that sense, price transparency is in some sense not a, uh, a policy endpoint rather, but more so a, a really a, a wheel that enables uh, many other types of policies to be enabled and enacted. We also thought about uh, the time horizon. So if you're regulating prices, that's something that's going to be pretty instantaneous. If you're relying on, on patients to you know, really change how they, they consume care and, and providers to, to think about this type of data, that's something that's going to take a little bit longer. Another potential concern about price transparency is the collusion idea. 
And so there's a potential concern that lower price providers may now all of a sudden see that they actually are lower priced and underpaid and ask for, for higher prices. And so we, we wanted to think about those potential uh, adverse consequences as well. The, uh, the, the next uh, thing we thought about, or the, the third kind of entree, if you will, is uh, wait, ways to increase provider competition. And so the, these policies range from increased state review of hospital consolidation, or uh, especially around nonprofit providers, or uh, uh, Federal uh, Trade Commission, Department of Justice uh, review of, of consolidation. And we, we also wanted to con consider uh, policies that would uh, you know, go out and be proactive in, in improving the, the competition in healthcare markets, as well as policies that are, are maybe a little more passive and try to keep healthcare markets as they are and prevent future consolidation or healthcare markets from getting more consolidated. Uh, our our high-level uh, uh, summary is presented in this table. And just from a, um, a kind of high-level impact, we, we found much larger impacts for policies, as, as maybe you, you expect, that try to directly think about prices. And so policies such as, as rate setting lead to, to the largest uh, uh, reductions, but it's really important to think about how uh, prices and how, how these policies are, are actually designed. So for example, if prices are, are set too high in a, at a level that's higher than, than prices currently are, then that's actually gonna be something uh, that, that's actually potentially going to lead to increases in prices. So for example, if we were to design a public option and set prices in this, this bottom level here at, uh, at 175% of Medicare, that would actually lead to a slight increase in, in hospital spending of about uh, 0.2 percentage points or about $2 billion per year. And that's because many um, exchange plans or AC exchange plans are actually priced below 175% Medicare. If we were to do the same policy and have a public option, but have exchange plans or public option plans rather be uh, 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 at Medicare rates or you know, paid the exact same as Medicare, that would lead to about a four and a half uh, point or percentage point rather uh, reduction in hospital prices. The largest impacts for for public uh, for for rate setting rather, uh, and again the, the rate settings are are all blue would be to directly cap prices for all private plans, so including uh, ERISA plans, uh, uh, state uh, regulator non-ERISA plans, as well as exchange plans. And there we'd find, as you might expect, much larger impacts based on, on the, the, the scale of Medicare rates. So if, uh, Medi or if all private plans were capped at 100% of Medicare rates or at exactly Medicare rates, uh, that would save about 40% on hospital prices per year. If that rate were 200% of Medicare rates, that would be about 7.5% of, of hospital spending per year because the average price for, for uh, private plans is actually above 200% of Medicare rates. We, we also go uh, into this detail in the report, but there would also be, uh, as you might expect, uh, much more potential for disruption and change to hospital and provider markets if you were to implement some of these more stringent policies. But in some sense, maybe that's uh, uh, you, you, uh, the, the trade-off that has to be made. Uh, saving money in, in reducing spending in healthcare is going to require some level of disruption. Our findings were uh, a little bit less supportive of things like price transparency and increased uh, market competition. So as you can see here, the, the orange uh, for, for price transparency and the gray for increased market competition, we find much smaller changes in, uh, in, in, uh, in hospital prices, as well as reductions in, in spending uh, for, for these two types of policies. For price transparency, a lot of the existing evidence is shown, as I mentioned earlier, that patients really uh, don't try and, and shop or you know, aren't, aren't that effective of shoppers for, for healthcare services. And so even if uh, patients were, I, I think, uh, using these services pretty well, we'd estimate that kind of the maximum level, this would save about $11 billion per year on, on healthcare on hospital spending per year. If employers were to be the conduit and uh, use this data to design networks and, and push patients to, to, in some sense, be the shoppers for patients, we'd estimate that that would actually lead to about 13.2 uh, to 26.6 billion dollars in savings per year. And so we 
do estimate certainly that the um, uh, uh, the employer use of price transparency and kind of the policymaker use of price transparency is probably a more efficacious use of price transparency than just relying on patients to shop. We also uh, found much smaller effects for uh, for market competition. Uh, the uh, basic idea here is that while uh, healthcare markets are, are certainly concentrated, and we we know that that concentration does lead to higher prices. If we were to kind of wave a, a magic wand and get that level of competition down, that would have maybe a less uh, impact on, on on prices while while still large than than directly thinking about prices. A important mechanism or driver here is just the context in which uh, hospital prices and insurers negotiate, and even a um, a you know hospital in a pretty competitive market or a hospital without much market share is still able to negotiate much higher prices than what Medicare pays. And so there we, we estimate that the, the impacts would actually be, while greater than price transparency, less than thinking about uh, directly addressing prices in, in hospital markets. And so uh, th those are our high level findings and I wanted to uh, save tw uh, time and, and answer any potential questions. Chris, thank you very much. <clears throat> very informative. Lots packed in there. I'll um, turn it back to uh, Chair Foster for questions uh, from uh, board members, the Advocates Office, and the public. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Whaley. Um, uh, I'll go. I'll go last. Tom, do you want to go first with any questions or comments you may have? Um, Sure. I just have a, a couple of things. It was um, thought it was a great point, uh, Chris. This is more of a comment, but um, you know, Stensland's work really flipping our understanding of of uh, the way we think about cost shifting, reversing the causality for all intents purposes. That was a very small study. Um, Cooper, all hospitals, um, but arranged in um, in groups, hospital referral regions. Um, and then your approach different. So it, it's um, three different ways of looking at that phenomenon coming to the same conclusion um, that it's not insufficient payments from uh, government payers that compel hospitals to charge more to private payers. Um, it's market power that allows uh, hospitals in, con in concentrated markets to raise prices. I think that's just a key point that we've learned along the way this spring. Um, and I thank you for pointing out the different methods that have arrived at the same conclusions. Um, you mentioned through your slides, you talked often about mergers and consolidation. And we have had some mergers and consolidation in Vermont, but certainly not on the scale that um, other parts of the country have seen. Um, Still, even without the degree of, of consolidation, our markets were concentrated before the mergers and acquisitions really took off because we're rural. We have 14 hospitals, right? So um, each hospital um, is in a fairly concentrated market. So could you tell, do your findings, do you know, do your findings hold in um, markets that are just concentrated, even if there hasn't been mergers or acquisitions that have led that have produced the concentration? Yeah. So, so one of the things we, we've noticed is where a lot of the higher, you know, especially higher price hospitals in the country uh, are sitting, and many of them are are actually not in markets where they've you know, gone out and acquired other hospitals and consolidated, it tends to be the much more what we economists call the, the natural monopoly markets. And so this is a market where, um, you know, frankly, there's just you know, only room for one or two hospital systems just because, it, you know, there's just not the, the population or, or the market base to support more, more hospitals. And those tend to be the markets where, you know, 
the market's consolidated and the prices are high, but it's not the kind of story that that we often I, I think tell ourselves of hospitals go out and you know merge and consolidate and then raise prices. Uh, it, you know the, the 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 higher market concentration and their their right prices are in some sense much more just a a feature of of how that you know market not just for healthcare but overall is constructed. Um, and so you know, economists in general tend to in those types of markets acknowledge that. There's just not a lot of room that antitrust enforcement can can do, uh, just because again that, that's how, how the market is, and so those tend to be the markets where I, I think many economists uh, view uh, thinking much more of sort of a, a public utility uh, environment and, and that type of uh, regulation to be more appropriate. Um, thank you, thank you for that, um, and and so that that kind of you got to one of my my follow ups that. Um, Transparency in in a rural state where the market is concentrated, um, has been concentrated. Transparency wouldn't be uh, thought to have much effect, um, if I'm understanding you correctly, because just knowing the price doesn't mean there are alternatives. Knowing the price requires so for transparency to work, there are two things that need to be required. So one. Um, you you need to have alternatives, and so you need to have the option to go from a high price to a lower price provider. And then the the second thing that needs to happen for transparency is the consumer, or in this case, that the patient needs to have the agency to make that choice. And so, if, if I'm at the grocery store and I, I see Coca Cola is uh, cheaper than Pepsi, I, I can grab to one shelf versus another, and that that's you know as most agencies I have. If my doctor refers me to a high priced MRI provider. I don't have the agency really to say that to my doctor. No, uh, I, I know better than you. Send me to a, a different uh, MRI provider. And so in healthcare, I think um, in many markets, both conditions aren't really met, which is one reason why I think uh, many studies have looked at the effect of kind of consumer-focused price transparency, including some of my own. Uh, in our study, just really um, aren't, uh, I, I think, supportive of maybe the, the hype that price transparency, at least on the consumer-focused side, has generated. That's very helpful. Um, one final thing, and, and it's kind of nerdy, I, and I know you won't mind, but I hope other people <laughs> will um, be okay. Could you, is it possible to pull your slides back up and go to slide 14? Sure. I think it's a really important slide, but it's also a bit, it's a bit technical. So I want to make sure that I understand it. Yeah, yeah this, this one. And so um, let me, I'm, let me have a go at explaining it and you just, correct me wherever I go off track. It's So with this, if the old thinking about cost shift were true, the way that I thought about it when I was um, in private practice myself back in the late 90s, early 2000s, essentially everything before Stensland's work in 2010, if the old way of thinking about it were true, we would expect these blue circles and dots to form a line at a, about a 45 degree angle up and to the right. Because as the proportion of Medicare, Medicaid, and uninsured patients in my practice approaches 100%, which is what the one represents, as it approaches that, I would have been compelled to charge private payers more. So the the line would slope up and to the right at about a 45 degree angle um, if the old argument were true. And because the line's flat and the dots are spread around like a shotgun um, shell, uh, this is further a further argument that the old way of thinking about it doesn't really hold. Is that correct or am I off? Uh, no, no th that's entirely correct. So the the cost shifting argument is I as a provider am, you know have no choice to break even uh, if I want to break even but charge higher prices to offset underpayments from 
uh, public prov providers or uninsured patients. And that is really the only reason I'm charging higher prices. And so if that's the case, then, well, we should see that providers and hospitals that have lots of non-private payers, so that's Medicare, Medicaid, uninsured, and charity care patients, should be the ones charging the higher prices. I mean, that, that, that is the, the cost-shifting argument. And patient or providers who have relatively few of those patients are actually the ones that are, are charging lowest prices just because they don't have that need to high, charge higher prices. Um, and as you uh, uh, said, you know, when I look at this, I you know, find no pattern, uh, no discernible pattern. And so it, it's not the case that a provider's price and variation in provider prices has anything to do with that provider's share of patients who are not commercial payers, so whether that's Medicare, their Medicaid or uninsured, uh, or charity care. And if we were to separate this out and say, well, let's just look at, at Medicaid or let's just look at Medicare or let's just look at uninsured versus charity care, uh, we, we'd find the exact same pattern. Uh, and so the, um, I, I think the main takeaway here is that providers charge what the market will bear. And when a provider is sitting down at a table across from a commercial payer negotiating prices, they say, look, you know, we've got, uh, you know, the best orthopedic surgery, uh, you know, department in town, or uh, we're, we're, you know, critical provider for your, your patients to have access to, uh, or, you know, we're in some cases the, the only uh, provider to have access to. And th those are the, the types of arguments that and uh, uh, factors that lead to whether or not a provider is paid more or less on commercial payers. And that has nothing to do with the non-commercial patients that they're, they're treating. Thank, thank you. That is really helpful. And I'm, um, I've been trying to uh, go over this point with each of our speakers because from a regulatory standpoint, it's, it's really important because if we do end up wanting to take steps to regulate prices, differently than we have been. Um, if the argument that provider systems will propose is that any reduction in that rate, in their commercial rates, um, because they're not paid well enough from Medicare and Medicaid, any reduction in those commercial rates will mean they're unable to break even or have a margin, and they'd be forced to close services or reduce um, access to care. And so I think it's really important for us when we're facing that pressure to understand that that's not the case. It's just not, it's just yeah. not the case. I, I would certainly agree with that. And if you're facing um, that type of question, I, I would again uh, reiterate uh, what we've been able to do with the, the Sage Transparency Tool, where we've been able to take our prices, uh, so th those are the prices I just showed, which are in the blue bars, and the the break-even price, and so, so this comes from a data resource developed by the National Academy for State Health Policy, where they're actually able to use hospitals' payer mix, so how many uninsured patients or Medicaid patients or Medicare patients does a hospital treat, and then what are the, the hospital's costs for treating those patients? And, and you know, to be clear that those costs and those payer mix aren't, um, you know, don't come from claims data or, or data that we've been able to, to come up with. Those come from the cost reports that hospitals report to, to Medicare as, uh, as a condition of participating in the Medicare program. And so if I were a, a regulator and, and thinking about um, that type of break-even argument, I would, you know, go straight to, to this type of chart where you can see that for, for many hospitals uh, in Vermont, there is a large gap between what they are, are charging and their break-even price, uh, suggesting that if that, that price were lower, uh, many of these hospitals would still make a, a comfortable margin. Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Um, I, I'll, I'll go next, if that's okay. I, I, I had a question sort of related to this. Um, so let's, I, I forget the exact numbers, but UVM or Rutland or Southwest were pretty high, 275, 290-ish um, in Vermont. And they already aren't breaking even or can't make a margin or having difficulty making a margin, right? So if we were as regulators to, you know, remove or lower some of that price, right, down to even the state median. There's a whole lot of money 
that's coming out of those systems that would save Vermonters a good amount of money, but the hospitals would have a lot less. And I guess the question from my perspective is, how do you do that without impacting quality or access or various service lines that they have? Where do you, because that money is going somewhere and they're using that money. So how do you save the money without having a negative impact? Um, so I, I guess two points. One, um, again, using data that that uh, hospitals are reporting uh, to to Medicare, um, this you know at least uh, in that data shows that they are uh, at least on the commercial payers making uh, some margin. And, and again, this is accounting for uh, negative margins on Medicare and and Medicaid uh, and, and our compensated care patients. And so I guess that that would be a, a first kind of data point that I. Uh, would maybe ask is kind of, you know, we, we see in the, the data that the hospitals are reporting to Medicare uh, that there, you know, is in fact a, a positive margin. And so if in other data uh, reporting, uh, there is a, a reported negative margin, then there is a discrepancy between the two. And so I, I would um, look at that. Um, what, what I would um, say, you know, for, for the second point is that we, we know that uh, these, you know, variation prices uh, uh, don't at least in, in our uh, study again aren't are necessarily explained by by underpayments from from commercial uh, or, or non-commercial payers rather, and don't have a strong link between price and and hospital performance and and quality, uh, uh, and so I, I would uh, maybe uh, push back a little bit on the the assertion that uh, the kind of Variation in prices that we see in in uh, across Vermont is cleanly linked to improvements and differences in hospital performance. So, but it, it, you know, it, it is a you know a, a point. So on on some scale, of if we if you were to reduce hospital uh, payments by you know in the single digit percentage, I I, I think that that would not have a huge impact on hospital performance. If you were to reduce hospital payments by 50%, uh, then that's you know a much more drastic change that would uh, have some impact. And so I, I, I guess the, the the key regulatory question I would say is what's the the level of um, price reductions and improvements in affordability that you are, are comfortable with, uh, knowing that there's some link between reductions in, in payments and hospital revenues and, and affordability or, or uh, disruption rather. Is there any particular, like when these systems that have um, higher prices due to market power, do you have any insights into where they're using that money? where that money is going like if, if if the hypothesis is they could have a positive margin on a lot less money but they have much higher rates where is that money going yeah uh so we we have tried to do this uh not necessarily in vermont but in in, in other uh settings so, so we know that hospitals that have higher prices and hospitals that that are uh more consolidated aren't hospitals that Pay their physicians and healthcare staff more, and so it's not going uh, towards um, you know the the clinician uh, staff. Uh, we we've done some work showing that it does lead to improvements in investment um, accounts, and so you know, certainly some of the you know at least again not necessarily specific to Vermont, but but nationally uh, in other large health systems, we've seen that higher prices and and improvements in, in revenue do lead to uh, larger investment accounts for, for hospital systems. Uh, again, that, that's not a Vermont assertion, that, that's a national uh, and large health system assertion. But I, I think a, just a, another um, you know, challenge is that, uh, especially with, with nonprofit firms, uh, higher revenue has to be spent somewhere. And so whether that's you know building um, you know, the, a fancy atrium or uh, spending uh, money on kind of non Clinical activities. Uh, that's potentially where where a lot of the uh, the f money goes. Um, I mean, for example, when, when a hospital is sitting there, when, when patients are selecting a hospital, in many cases they 
uh, select that hospital based on maybe not what's the remission rate, but what's the, the atrium look like, what's the, the facility look like. And so that's just a, a huge incentive for um, hospitals to invest in kind of those amenity uh, type quality uh, areas. Thank you very much. Um, other board members? I'll jump in um, because I have a couple of similar questions. So um, when when I last spoke with Nashby about their um, their tool, I asked them point blank if they thought it was an appropriate tool for regulation, given in in their mind it was designed for employer negotiation purposes. And they told me no. They said they they thought you would want to do um, sort of a deeper dive, more nuanced analysis than using their break-even tool across the board because of issues in terms of the cost reports and how uh, items get booked. So I don't know if you you had talked with them about that at all, but just curious in terms of your reaction to that. Um, so I, I think that while if you're thinking of the exact say break even point uh you may also in addition to cost reports want to look at things like audit financial statements um uh, but my my general um new reaction to is a, a starting point I, I think the nashby tool actually is appropriate to at least kind of identify high level uh, issues around uh break even and, and margins thanks um so i did want to talk more about um your slide 19 and the regulation of prices. So in our current hospital budget prices, budget process, we are not regulating prices as a percentage of Medicare, but we are capping commercial growth and overall revenue growth. So uh, certainly I would expect, you know, the impact to be different when you're regulating price growth from where it's sort of developed mm -hmm inherently prior to the hospital budget process, which quite frankly would have been probably in the 80s um, in this state. Um, but I wondered if you had any thoughts on that in terms of regulating percentage growth versus uh, price. Uh, so, so my um, general thought is that regulating prices is maybe more tractable than regulating overall growth in spending, just because there are, are lots of things that contribute to differences in spending and prices. It's it's maybe easier to think about, um, you know, how much you pay for goods and services rather than everything else that, that can impact uh, quantity and, and utilization. Um, my, I guess my second thought is that I, I think that the benchmarking to Medicare uh, might, or at least is one way to, account for new, say, technologies that are introduced. So if um, new cancer therapies are introduced, then it's important to think about how those should be incorporated into to the, uh, the spending or price benchmarks. And so percent of Medicare is a way to account for introduction of new technologies and just kind of general medical inflation that's accounted for in, in Medicare benchmarks. So essentially, if you were to do that, then you're tying yourself to not a state specific rate of growth, but to the national Medicare growth, because presumably if you're setting it to a percentage of Medicare, you're incorporating all of that Medicare policy that happens annually on a federal basis. That's right. Uh, with the caveat that our so Medicare also has geographic adjustments, which we've incorporated in our data. And so if you're uh, incorporating the Met present Medicare plus the geographic adjustments, then it's it's making it more specific to to Vermont. Uh, with the, you know, of course, the caveat that you are still tying yourself to what the Medicare system has decided to pay for services over time, uh, which may or may not be appropriate for an individual state. Um, thanks. That was helpful. So another area that Vermont has been looking at. Um, so we had a big report around. Um, price regulation to the Vermont legislature, the board did a couple years ago and looked at both incorporating fee for service rate setting along with uh, sort of a more a higher level approach where we would look at creating global hospital payments, similar to what's happening with Medicare in Maryland and Pennsylvania. Um, and that is an effort that we are currently looking at and we're funded to explore. Um, 
So I, I wondered if you had any thoughts in terms of how your research might be applicable to the establishment of global hospital payments, um, which would, I think, in our case, uh, potentially then have the complementary existing um, global hospital, or our current hospital budget process, which looks, as I said, not just at overall spending, but also commercial price growth. Okay, a, a clarification. So would the potential policy be you know, similar to the Maryland policy where every where a hospital gets paid in a on a price level the same per patient by payer? Or would it so, be a kind of more global budget where uh, the global budget is, is more fixed towards spending per patient? Yeah, we're looking at both approaches currently in a stakeholder group, although I think that that it's a heavy it would be a heavy lift for us to institute fee for service rate setting if we're moving away from fee for service payments. So my, my initial reaction, um, and again not knowing what you've already done, uh, is that the challenge with the Maryland model is that while commercial prices are low, everyone else is much higher. And so it's it's still not clear on net whether or not you know, average per patient prices are, are lower in Maryland versus neighboring states. And I, I think, you know, if economists were to, you know, wave a wand and, you know, or healthcare researchers wave a wand and, and start, uh, you know, healthcare policy, you know, go back, you know, 40 years, I, I don't think we'd rely necessarily on the Medicare fee-for-service system as the most efficient system. Uh, and would think much more about a global budget based on spending uh, level that's you know been widely adopted across the country or across the world uh, in outside the United States. And so, if you know again, not knowing complexities uh, and you know the, the lift for doing Maryland style is is much lower than um, you know non-U.S. global budget systems. Uh, but that certainly is the I think the way to appropriate align uh, clinical and financial incentives. Right, and if you have a, a, a lead on a magic wand store, I'm definitely in the market <laughs> yeah. for one, so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Jesse, you okay if I go next? So thank you, Chris. A really interesting presentation. Um, I, I guess I just have a few more questions. I'm just trying to understand the this slide 12 with the the blue bar and the green bar, and I, I, I guess I'm just sort of trying to further expand on Chair Foster's question regarding what what accounts for the difference between those two and hospitals that are essentially having zero or barely positive or near or negative slightly negative margins because those are pretty dramatic differences for a lot of hospitals uh yes so, so they are dramatic differences i i think it's uh potentially uh going in you know contributing to how net margins are reported and what are the the factors that are are in um overall margins versus what's in the cost report, which uh, from my understanding are much more operational expenses. Um, and so that that I, I think is a, a first place to look. Um, but yeah, I, 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 you know, this has always been surprising to me on just the, uh, the level of margin for many healthcare systems. But this, so this, um, this difference is between the blue and the green and the way this is reported is indicated that that is, that is margin that's being made off of commercial adjusted for Medicare, Medicaid and uninsured. That, that's right. So the, the green bar is what the hospital have to charge Medic or sorry, commercial patients after adjusting for their other payer mix and the uh, the hospital's reported cost for those payers, uh, and what they'd have to charge commercial payers to to break even on the, on that amount. Um, and then the blue bar is what they're actually charging. And so again, for for many of these hospitals, that is a dramatic difference, suggesting large margins. Because I I think. 
part of our hard work, maybe try and understand, you know, the nuance there, maybe of some of what Robin had mentioned and what makes up the green break even price, but really that that difference uh, and to try and understand why we're, we're why there is such a large difference there uh, without having yes, positive <laughs> margins. Uh, well, yes, yeah, so, so I, I think a um, question is is whether or not the you know how true the, the negative margins are are actually uh, given what hospitals are reporting uh, on on their essentially their operating statements to to Medicare. Um, and just one other question to sort of piggyback on someone else's question uh, regarding potential price regulation benchmarking to Medicare prices. If I mean, it's clear you've thought about this a lot, um, and we've talked about the potential benefits of that, but what would be some downsides to benchmarking off of Medicare? Yeah, so uh, I, I guess this gets into the the magic wand uh, discussion, uh, where so the the disadvantages of benchmarking to Medicare are uh, that this is a you know a single um, benchmark that's designed by a agency in Washington D.C. and who knows exactly how right that price is relative to you know what Medicare says the right price is relative to a hospital in uh, Burlington, Vermont. Uh, the, I think the advantages of the so if we had a magic wand, you know, we'd develop a benchmarking system for Vermont or you know New England hospitals. Um, the advantages of the Medicare system are that it's one, it's it's the kind of most comprehensive benchmarking system that we have in the country, and so it's been developed over over decades with lots of input from industry and, and stakeholders around designing a efficient uh, benchmark. It's also transparent. And so you know anyone can go out and, and download how much Medicare pays for a given service. And so it's not like a lot of the, I think, uh, other you know risk adjusters that are, are maybe a little bit more black boxy and it's hard to see exactly what, what's going on under the hood. Um, and then I, I think another thing that I is in favor of the Medicare or using Medicare as a benchmark is that many of the things that I think that many people would agree that are, are reasonable reasons to pay different or pay hospitals differently. So whether or not that's they're in a say higher cost of care region or cost more to hire uh, nurses and physicians in those regions, or their their patients are, are more complex, or they do uh, a more complex array of services are incorporated into the, the Medicare benchmark. Um, I think I'm going to pass off to Jess now, but thank you so much. With, I think there's a, go ahead. With, with, yeah, with, with the caveat that, so I, I mentioned that we also uh, have a secondary price measure that is uh, uh, standardized or case mix adjusted prices. And so that that is actually not percent of Medicare, but it, it's just, it, it adjusts for differences in patient and procedural complexity, but it has a average price. And so if the percent of Medicare and the additional payments that go into the Medicare system uh, are maybe um, not warranted in terms of thinking about addressing prices, then that's a alternative where uh, you could say that in a case mix adjusted way, um, prices above say $30,000 for inpatient discharge or inpatient service are ones that deserve attention versus some other threshold. Um, thanks for that. I, I, yeah, I'm going to pass to Jess, but thank you. And uh, this is a great conversation. Yeah, thank you very, very much. So appreciate your time. Chris, it's nice to see you again. Um, and I wanted to say that that pricing um, study that you've done, um, you know, I know how much time and effort it takes to pull that all together. And just thought I would share with you that we have incorporated that in our hospital budget process as one of the many, you know, data inputs that we have to start to think about um, prices across our hospital okay. system. So your your efforts there uh, are, are helpful to us. So I know sometimes, you know, you do research and you wonder if anybody's using it. So <laughs> we are using That's it. So thank you. I appreciate that very much. Um, actually, my questions were largely uh, asked and answered by others. That's the beauty of going last. And I, I guess I was just going to say, I think slide 12 has 
raised a few questions um, for us. That's the slide, you know, with the price and uh, benchmark uh, break-even price compared to the commercial price. And I, I guess I would just say I think maybe this is something we can bring back to our own hospital budget team if if, if they have time, which I know it's there's always time is limited, but trying to understand what is uh, what is the Nash P tool. Um, that that you know is being used here. What are the cost inputs that are going into that break-even price compared to, you know, that Burns analysis that we've done? Chris, you don't know this, but we've done this uh, analysis looking at price-to-cost ratios from one of our contractors. And so, just trying to understand, I think that would be helpful. What is in the assumptions there? Uh, so, something I think for potentially for our hospital budget team to to think about and and maybe help us do a deeper dive and understanding. But it's really really helpful to see that data and see a different look at it. And I just, you know, I don't have any additional questions, but I did want to thank you for your time. I know it uh, takes effort to put these presentations together and, and come, you know, before a board. So thank you very, very Great. much. Hello. Thank you for having me. At 802 Should we leave Ms. Melamed a message? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. I'm going to turn to the healthcare advocate for any questions Hello. or comments they may have. They may have. Board, Thanks. Board. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Chair Foster. I just wanted to ask: Do we have a hard stop at 2:30? Because if so, I want to ensure there's time for public comment, um, and I'll kind of triage my questions. Um, um, Chris, Chris, are you up? Are you up? Are you up to 2:30? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I can yeah, see. I can see. But I, I'm, I, hearing, I, I'm uh, hearing echo. echo. Horrible, horrible. Um, hello, hello. Born, born at 802 Christian, could you mute that? I just muted it. I just muted it. Okay, I'll just go ahead. Um, and if interruptions happen, it's, it's all good. Um, Thank you, Dr. Whaley. Uh, appreciate the presentation. Um, I'm hoping to start off just by asking a, few, a question related to part four of your um, employer-led transparency initiative. And specifically, there was one Vermont finding that UVM medical centers, their prices for outpatient and inpatient were in the uh, second and third highest deciles in the nation. And I know some board members have focused on the margin slide that you presented. And the reason I bring this up specifically is when this was asked, uh, we asked about this during the hospital budget hearing process, and UVM told the board that you, your team admitted there was a fundamental fault, fault in the methodology for how price was calculated because of the role of factors like graduate medical education money and how different institutions count Medicare costs. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity to comment on that and if that was an accurate characterization. Um, uh, yeah, so I, yeah, so I, I, I still hearing that echo. Just go in, just go in. Um, um, so I, so I, I had a conversation, I had a conversation. Or an email conversation with, uh, I think, Stephen Kappel from Vermont, and uh, then heard that that was mischaracterized to say that uh, there's, you know, our, our analysis is flawed. Um, and so I, I, I think that's certainly not uh, obviously what, what I would uh, characterize it as. I think that, uh, as I said earlier, there are probably very good reasons to adjust for many of the additional payments that Medicare makes, and um, uh, and you know, including graduate medical ed education, you know, labor costs, uh, et cetera. And so, those are, I think, reasonable adjustments to make. But as I said earlier, um, if you don't feel like those are reasonable, we we have an alternative measure that that strips those out. And so, uh, it's really up to the I think the the user, the policymaker, to to think about how they actually use those uh, uh, or which, which price metric to use. The the second component or thing that I would say is that those, uh, especially the graduate medical education uh, components of, of percent of Medicare actually bring down uh, the price relative to Medicare for a academic center. And so if you feel that those are, are inappropriate, then that's actually going to make academic medical centers higher relative to, to their um, uh, Vermont peers. Great. Thank you for that. Um, in slide two of the presentation, you did the breakdown of concentrated markets and competitive markets. And I'm wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit on what uh, criteria are used for those. I know you mentioned the FTC. Um, I'm, I'm also just curious if you know offhand, fine if you don't, 
how Vermont would, would fit in, what category they would fit in. Um, uh, so for the, so for the, the second, the second question, question, I don't know, I don't offhand know offhand how, how Vermont would compare, but that's something that uh, I can check actually this afternoon and, and get back and, and send if, if helpful. Um, to construct those, we use metrics that are, are widely used by, as I said earlier, the FTC, DOJ, and other regulators called the uh, the hirschman herfindahl Index. And so that is a, uh, a range uh, on a, based on, on market concentrations uh, that basically look at what, what are the number of, of uh, providers or firms in a market and what is their respective market share and then how do they essentially add up to to contribute to a overall market uh, competitiveness. And so this, this is a, a number or an index rather that ranges from uh, zero, and so if it's it's you know close to zero, then that's a or a small number, then that's a really competitive market. If it's ten thousand, then that's a market that's dominated by a single firm. And we we use the the thresholds that the Federal Trade Commission has developed of uh, a market above two thousand five hundred as a highly concentrated market. Mayor Walsh, I see your hand up. Yeah, Sam, we have those we have numbers. those numbers <laughs> if you, yeah. I can share them with you but um, very quickly we have 14 hospitals 10 of which have an HHI score of the maximum 10,000 meaning fully concentrated no hospital has a score below 2500 so then I, I guess the analog there would be that on that slide two chart everyone in Vermont would be in that top highly concentrated market. Thank you for that. Appreciate it, Member Walsh. Um, you published a piece with GBI at the end of March in Health Affairs that looked at primary drivers of losses at nonprofit health systems. So I wanted to ask you about that as well. Um, you found, I believe, I'm quoting this correctly, that 85% of overall financial off losses were related to investment losses. And, I'm, and one of your conclusions was that the public shouldn't foot the bill for these investment losses. And I'm wondering if you had any recommendations for how a regulator like the board can get at and analyze what percentage, like basically what you did, and if you have any recommendations for how they can make a you know rate setting decision or a hospital budget decision based on that. Yeah, that, that, that's a really good uh, question. So um, uh, just for clarification. So this is a, a paper uh, published in Health Affairs Forum in, I believe, uh, early or mid-March uh, of this year with, with G. Bai, who's a professor of accounting at the, the John Thompson Carey School of Business and is a widely recognized national expert in hospital accounting. Uh, what One of the, the kind of uh, source of this the study is that you know, we've you know, heard for, you know, I think, you know, since you know throughout the pandemic, that hospitals were being uh, hit hard financially, and if you look at uh, kind of hospital kind of net revenue statements or the you know the the press releases that they put out, they all indicated, especially in the last year, very large operating losses. And so uh, we we wanted to dive in that a little bit deeper and looked not at the kind of high level numbers, but actually looked at the components of those numbers, and in particular looked at for ten large national healthcare systems their bond filings or the bond reportings that they were. Uh, filing to um, uh, to comply with with regulations around uh, raising taxes and bonds, and as part of those uh, uh, bond financial statements, there are detailed explanations of income and, and revenue losses for for these health systems. And when we looked a little bit closer, what we found is that for uh, all ten of the systems, they had all experienced very large financial losses through. Uh, through basic investment losses. So like I'm sure many people in the call, uh, you know, my, my 401k went down a lot. Uh, and if you have, you know, a billion dollars in the stock market, like many large hospital systems, then you, uh, they, they lost a considerable amount of money. And so when we did the, uh, the add up on how much of the losses are say due to, uh, you know, labor expenses versus uh, equipment expenses versus these investment losses, nearly all the financial losses were due to investment losses. Um, and so I, I think that kind of ties back to the uh, point I had earlier around hospital margins. Uh, if I were thinking about what are the net uh, margins for, for a provider, I would think very closely about what are the actual kind of 
operating expense margins uh, versus the business-wide margins, which would include things like investment gains or losses. Great, thank you. That's super helpful. Um, last question to me, I thought something that I struggle with is really a true measure of cost, possible costs. So I'm, I'm wondering if you have any perspectives about if Medicare is cost plus some percentage of, of margin, and if so, how, how do we know that? Uh, so, so just to clarify, is the question on whether or not, whether or not Medicare costs represent a break-even cost for a hospital plus some margin or uh, uh, something else? Something else. The former, yeah, just what you said. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, 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 so Medicare costs and, and rather payments from Medicare to hospitals for a given service are designed to represent what the, the Medicare Payment Advisor Commission uh, calls a, a adequate uh, uh, re reimbursement level for efficient hospitals. And for efficient hospitals, Medicare payments are designed to uh, represent roughly, I think, a uh, break-even plus a margin of, I think, around 3 to 5%. And so for uh, efficient ho uh, hospitals, uh, Medicare payments are, yes, in fact, designed to uh, to be adequate. Great, thank you. Those are all my questions. Back to you, Chair Foster. Uh, Robin, go ahead. I just had a quick follow up on that, Chris. Um, does that take into consideration the impact of sequestration? Because I we used to talk about Medicare as being for at least for critical access hospitals as being, uh, you know, cost quote unquote plus two percent, but then the impact of sequestration dropped that to 99 percent of quote unquote cost. So I was just wondering how you think about sequestration and the impacts. Now, obviously, that was yeah. not happening during the pandemic, but then is going to be reinstated. Um, that that That's a, a question I have to get back to you on. I mean, that, that's, that's actually a question for Jeff Stensland uh, at, at MedPAC. Um, uh, so I, I would defer to him on that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and Professor Whaley, if you need to get going, respecting your time, you're welcome to. Um, we do public comment yet uh, next. You can stick around for that if you want, or if you need to go, that's also totally fine. Uh, if there are comments, I, I can actually stay until um, uh, the top of the hour. Oh, great. Thank you very much for doing that. We appreciate it. Um, and I'll turn it to public comment via the raise your hand function. Um, Mr. Del Treco, please go ahead. Good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, offer public comment, Chair Foster. Um, I found the, uh, the the three presentations on your uh, roundtable, uh, starting with uh, Jeff Steslin, Zach Cooper, to be uh, interesting. Um, I just want to uh, say that Zach Cooper really offered some incredible data, and he and he did a really nice pause at the end and said. Um, be careful of how we look at this data and 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 make sure we understand the local market. Um, I find this presentation to be dangerous, frankly. Um, we've talked about cost shift, whether there is a cost shift, whether there isn't a cost shift. Um, if we look at our own data internally, um, we do know what our operating margin result is. And nine of our 14 hospitals in 2022 um, lost money um, from operating margin, not investments. There were even times where this board contemplated on pulling in those other operating investments um, in times of, uh, of uh, where there were plenty in, in investments uh, coming down. Um, you know, when I look at other uh, supporting um, evidence around the Commonwealth Fund where our state of Vermont ranks sixth in our performance on many metrics of cost, quality, access, um, equity, and health outcomes. Um, I, I just, there's a large disconnect between this presentation, uh, what's being proposed as margins, what's pro proposed as being, uh, let's take a look at the accuracy of what uh, has been filed in Medicare cost reports, um, the lack of appreciation, understanding for audited financial statements, um, I, I think this is borderline um, problematic for me. I'm typically a, a pretty 
uh, level, realistic uh, approach, and I and I found the other presentations uh, helpful, informative. I I do find this one uh, very problematic for many reasons. Um, you know, in the state of Vermont, we uh, proposed and implemented a, a, a um, health insurance plan called Catamount Health that was pegged to Medicare at 120%. That failed because the delivery system uh, uh, was was happy with those rates, but um, the funding could not be supported. Um, we have a reform model in place, the all-payer model, which all of our hospitals participate in and actually fund and fund 100%. There's no um, technical advisory or transitional support funding. Um, and we have an ecosystem that is completely on fire. And when it's on fire, it shows up in our organizations. We can debate um, uh, economic data, we can debate um, the all of the discussions we've heard over the last three weeks. Um, the information right in front of us is highly problematic. Um, and, and I know we're working all hard working in the same direction to uh, solve some of these problems. Um, but I, I just uh, wanted to share my thoughts today. So thank you. Thank you very much for your comment, um, Mr. Del Treco. The next hand raises Mr. Ham Davis. How are you? Please go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, can I? Is it allowed to ask the, the Mr. Whaley a question, or do you uh, only take comments? Yeah, we typically okay. just take comments. But if you have a question, please go ahead. Yeah, I just I want to know what, what I want to know in his calculations, what methodologies he was using to measure uh, the quality of care, which is a critical critical uh, issue in this whole thing. Well, could he tell us that? Could he tell us that? We were using PQI. Uh, we're using PQI here. We're using PAU here. Um, no real quality, in, in my judgment, is great. But uh, but we um, but uh, but uh, we do have some. And what I just don't know is what methodology you're using to say whether care is high quality, or low quality, or medium quality. Uh, yeah, ha happy to answer that. Um, I, I just pulled up slides, so if you can see that, I mean, th these are the, uh, the the metrics that we used, uh, and the 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 peer reviewed paper that uh, we published is this in is, is listed at the bottom. Uh, th these include um, things like uh, mortality rates for a variety of of, uh, of procedures, uh, especially cardiac procedures, uh, uh, knee and hip replacement rate or readmission rates. Um, uh, readmission rates for other procedures, uh, heart failure rates, uh, et cetera. And so, um, what one, you know, of course, caveat with this is that this is, you know, designed, this is uh, classified among the Medicare population. And to the extent to which uh, a hospital's quality and performance for which they treat Medicare patients also is representative of how they treat commercial and Medicaid patients. Then this is probably an indicator of of hospital overall quality. But if there are, are differences in, in how a hospital treats the two patients or outcomes between the two uh, the different patient populations, then maybe we need to have a, a quality metric for for those uh, populations as well. I hope that answered your question. It's good. Just one quick follow up. Did you do any of that that kind of analysis on the hospitals in Vermont? Uh, th this is a uh, including all hospitals in Medicare, and so the the slide that I, I just showed uh, is is not specific to to just Vermont hospitals, but the uh, the hospitals in Vermont have those same quality outcomes and, and metrics. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, can I have one comment, Mr. Chair? Please go ahead. Um, I agree with Mike Del Treco. I think that that the, what the difference between I don't doubt the whole rest of the United States, but the this is the only system that I know of in the United States where the uh, where the state where the regulator has power over the ability to over the amount that the provider can charge the payer that is completely controlled by the Green Mountain Care Board. And I just don't, I don't, and I don't know myself of any other system that does that. I wonder if you do. Um, Mr. Whaley, if you have a response you'd like to share, go ahead. And if not, um, Tom Walsh has his hand raised as well. 
Um, yeah, I mean, so, so my, my you know, quick response is that I, I you know, certainly agree with um, you know Zach Cooper's comments that every every healthcare market is is local, and so it's important to to have local insight onto local markets. And so I, I think that's where uh, the Green Mountain Care Board has been, I think, really important in you know taking data and, and trying to learn nationally uh, lessons that can be applied locally and how policies that are maybe proposed uh, nationally need to to be modified locally. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your comments and questions. Go ahead, Tom. I think you're good. I think you're muted, Tom. Um, thanks. And thank you, Dr. Whalen. Um, I think it's important with the slide that you just had up about um, quality and prices that um, the the key there is that as prices have risen, quality has not changed, right? So it's not as though the increased prices that have come from consolidation have been accompanied by improvements in outcomes or quality as the system has come together. And the original idea about consolidation was that there'd be better communication better care coordination, and better outcomes. And unfortunately, I was part of health policy people thinking the same thing at the same time. We just haven't seen that. So that slide isn't, a, a, isn't making a point about the quality of care in Vermont. The quality of care in Vermont's been high as far as we've been able to see. Just hasn't gone up as the prices have gone up. Second, I, every, every state has a regulatory board for healthcare. Many states have multiple. Vermont is unique in that we have one board that looks at hospital budgets, insurance rate review, certificate of need, and healthcare reform efforts. Currently, we talk about that as ACOs, but every state has a healthcare regulatory board that looks at um, quality, safety, and prices. Maryland has set prices since the 1970s. Other states have followed, but it's been going on for my lifetime. It's not new. We're not the only one that's talked about it. Uh, yeah, so I, I just in response, I, I would agree with both those points. Um, I, I think, the, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, kind of purported goal of consolidation and um, price activity in healthcare, especially on the hospital side, is that maybe prices will go up and, and markets will become more consolidated. But in some sense, that is financially needed to fund care coordination, improvements in quality, uh, and and things that we we actually do highly value. And if we look, you know, especially nationally, we we just, you know, we've seen that the first part, but as I said earlier, not the, the second part on, on how those those you know increased spending and, and financial resources to providers actually do in turn uh, uh, improve the quality of care for patients. Thank you. And uh, Walter, how are you? Please, please go ahead. Hi, Owen. Thanks again. Uh, I enjoyed the the presentation. I am of the opinion that this is the report in a essence was again problematic, but for reasons different than what Mike Del Treco listed is I think this is what we should have been looking at doing far more of. The question Chris asked of where is the money going is a really good question. Because and then he said doctors and staff are not being paid well, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's a reason for all the strikes that have been going on. Um, another issue I have looking at it from 40,000 feet as a patient, and I've been through the hospital system before in Vermont hospital and insurance system, and I can tell you that it is not a system geared for care. It's a system geared for profit. And the patient is looked at not as a patient in many cases by the whole system. 
not individual cases, as a consumer, because that is where the revenue comes from. And there's something very grotesque about that. So in other words, from 40,000 feet, the problem is, is that we look at hospitals, et cetera, healthcare as a marketplace. And human lives shouldn't be a marketplace. And when you say the words affordability, affordability is what the market can afford. And if you can't afford it, well, tough luck. So I think we should be really looking at this report. Great. Thank you very much, Walter. Um, I appreciate your comments. Um, Mr. Whaley, I think that's it for the public comments. And um, thank you very much for taking the time to put all this together. It was certainly uh, thought provoking and important information for us to receive and, and to contemplate in our work. So thank you for doing it because I think it makes all of us um, more informed and better at these jobs. So thank you. Right. Well, thank you for having me. Of course. Um, and with that, I'll turn to uh, is there any old business to come before the board? Any new? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you all very much and have a nice afternoon.